Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, very happy to be here. Um, I lead the uh, Scalable System Software Group in Sandia Center for Computing Research. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, a perspective on future challenges for HPC networking at scale. So my goals for this talk are to provide a perspective on how networks have evolved, describe the hardware, application, and software trends that I think will impact future HPC networks, talk about some of the challenges to be addressed to ensure that networks uh, continue to meet the requirements for future HPC systems. So mostly what I'm going to talk about is the fact that um, over time, the complexity of the systems that we're dealing with has significantly increased, and uh, the use of commodity technology has also increased, uh, and sort of the impacts that that creates uh, for us from an HPC networking standpoint. So my background, I've spent nearly 30 years at Sandia working on operating systems and networking technologies for large-scale high-performance computing systems. For those of you that don't know the national lab structure in the Department of Energy National Labs, we typically are the leaders in high-performance computing systems. We deploy the fastest and largest uh, systems, and we partner with our, our vendor community to actually uh, help design and build those systems and deploy them as well. The focus of my research has been on network endpoints rather than network fabric, so I leave all the mesh problems off to smarter people who can deal with topologies and things like that. The focus of my work uh, has really been on uh, application programming interfaces and low-level network APIs, um, the point where the, the software meets the hardware. So working on things like the message passing interface, which is the dominant technology used uh, for high-performance computing uh, and scientific parallel computing. Um, Low-level APIs as well, uh, so we have uh, things that we've designed at Sandia that, and have been deployed in, in commercial technologies as well, but basically partnering with the vendor community to deliver a low-level API that need, meets the needs that uh, we have for high-performance computing. And then a little bit of hardware software co-design. So uh, one of the things I'll talk about is low-level programming APIs and a mismatch and trying to get the software and the hardware uh, to work better together. Um, and so I had some success doing that with uh, uh, various networking technologies that have been deployed and, uh, and that we've been researching as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about hardware. I'm going to go back 30 years uh, where some of you may not have been born yet, um, but this is where I got my start with high performance networking. So this is the fastest system in 1994. This is an Intel Paragon that's about 2,000 nodes, very simple node architecture. The, uh, each node had two Intel i860 processors, floating point optimized processors from Intel, um, sort of designed specifically for scientific computing, attached to a memory bus. On that memory bus obviously was memory, uh, but also the network interface controller was basically just a set of FIFOs and uh, a DMA engine. So all together on the memory bus, very simplistic architecture. Uh, and so not a lot of complexity there. Uh, I've, I've got a few descriptions of, of how it worked uh, there as well. But the whole point of this was that everything was optimized for doing high performance networking. In fact, the Intel i860, it came with two processors. One of them was supposed to be dedicated to just doing message processing. Uh, the application people didn't like that, so they figured out, we figured out other ways for them to use that second processor and not do network processing, but that was the whole point of that, that second processor. Um, it ran a custom software stack as well, which I'm not going to talk a whole lot about, but it was a lightweight kernel that we designed at, at uh, Sandy along with our low-level networking API. Fast forward a little bit in time, our next big system at Sandia that we helped develop was in partnership with Cray, which was recently subsumed into HPE. But back when they were still at Cray, uh, we worked on uh, what became the Cray XT3. So this was, ended up being Cray's uh, uh, most popular uh, supercomputer. They sold more racks of this than anything they did in their history. Uh, we partnered with them to design, to co-design the network interface and the network uh, switch that ran on this machine. What you can see here is we've moved from a custom design net node and, and uh, attached network on the memory bus to a more commodity uh, solution. So we had to have AMD processors, AMD Opteron processors. Uh, we couldn't integrate the network on, interface on the memory bus anymore, so it had to be at the other side of, of what was essentially an IO bus, um, hypertransport. Uh, we tried to do as much offload as we could in the C-Star as well, so we designed protocols and uh, upgraded our portals interface to actually do network processing on that 
uh, uh, embedded IBM processor that was on uh, the CSTAR network interface. So again, you can see the complexity of the system getting a little bit higher as we have the, the network on the other side of a different bus. Fast forward all the way to today. So this is the current fastest system in the world that's deployed at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. This is the HPE Frontier system. About 10,000 nodes, so not a significantly larger number of nodes than we had back in, in the 2007 timeframe. But look at the complexity that's in this machine now. So you've got multiple different price types of processors, CPUs and GPUs, three different types of memory. You've got on-chip networks, you've got on-package networks, and you've also got uh, an attached network interface. So significantly more complexity to deal with. Interestingly, as we move towards more commodity, the network interface that's on these, on this machine and, and the other two DOE exascale machines that are coming, I guess Aurora from Argonne has already been deployed, but the El Capitan system at Lawrence Livermore, they're all gonna be using HPE's Slingshot network. Slingshot is based on Ethernet. So at the lowest level, it's Ethernet compatible. It uses the Ethernet Phi. And so this is a big change as well. We've gone from the fact that our networks for HPC used to be specifically designed, custom designed to do networking specifically for HPC, we're now leveraging as much of that commodity technology as possible. So again, increasing complexity, but also moving towards more commodity. And you can see it's also there from a, a software standpoint as well. We've gone from doing custom lightweight OSs to, to using Linux and, and more commodity things at the network programming layer. So I mentioned Slingshot being a superset of Ethernet. This is a significant change for us. I think there's been an effort in HPC for a long time to figure out how to leverage commodity networking technology. Uh, we used to have these panels where it was Ethernet versus Ethernet. Who was going to win? Uh, was it going to be commodity? Was it going to be custom? Um, the number of players in that, in that space is significantly fewer than it was before. So I think it's still being decided, but uh, uh, not so much of an, uh, an issue anymore. So I've talked about some of these hardware trends that are impacting HPC networks. Uh, so we have multiple different types of memory, multiple different types of compute nodes, uh, compute engines. Uh, different data paths and different bus speeds. So these all have very different characteristics that are leading to increasing the complexity of the systems that we deal with. And we don't see this changing, right? We are using GPUs right now, and we've been trying to figure out how to use them effectively for the last 10 plus years. But now we've also got an influx of other accelerator technologies that we're looking at as well. So there's a significant number of technologies in data flow that are being developed. AI ML op uh, optimizers. We have people working on things like um, analog computing accelerators because there's an energy uh, efficiency aspect to analog computing as well. So we're trying to deal with that. How do we continue to have uh, to be able to incorporate all these different kinds of accelerators on our nodes and integrate them with the network effectively? Increasing network link speed is also a challenge for us. Um, and I think for everybody in the networking community, if you look at the speeds, the link speeds that we're going to, getting a new packet every 1.2 nanoseconds doesn't leave you a whole lot of time to do something interesting. You've got to figure out ways to parallelize things at the network interface level. Uh, I mentioned the viability of Ethernet for Slingshot. That's sort of changing things for us uh, on multiple fronts, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, there's also an effort in, in the hardware community to, to leverage chiplets to do customization, and so uh, that's impacting us as well. People are looking at what specialization and customization we might be able to do from not only the node uh, perspective, but also the network perspective. And I mentioned this decrease in overall node count. For, so from an HPC perspective, the, the at scale for us is the complexity. It's not the number of endpoints, it's the complexity that's really driving. Uh, us in terms of, the, it's the scale of that complexity. So I always get asked, what about smart NICs for HPC? Uh, how do you see that impacting what you guys are doing? Um, from my perspective, uh, they were really designed to offload network virtualization uh, protocols. There's been lots of research in the HPC community looking at how to effectively use them. And what you see is a lot of uh, the ways that we're using smart NICs is to offload application comp uh, computation not to do anything really intelligent from a networking standpoint, but figuring out how to use them as sort of the coprocessors. Like when we had two Intel i860 processors, now we've got a network that's got processors on it too, and we're just kind of figuring out how to offload applications to that. So we've had some success in doing that. But for us, the fundamental problem that we still have is how to integrate in GPUs into the network more, more efficiently. And smart NICs don't really make that any easier. 
The programming model that you use to program SmartNICs is a little bit of a mismatch for high performance computing where we're used to doing message passing and you need the message abstraction when you're doing processing. And unfortunately, everything that looks like the SmartNICs do is based on packets. And so you lose that abstraction, you lose the ability to actually do something interesting from a network perspective. Depositing the entire message into the NIC before you can actually do processing on it doesn't really lend, uh, lead to a whole lot of interesting things that you can do. Um, and then there's an added cost factor, not only in terms of the amount of money that it takes uh, above uh, traditional networking uh, to purchase them, but also the power energy that goes into them. And so power energy when you're building large scale things uh, like HPC systems is a significant concern. So smart NICs still have a place, right? They still work really well for the edge computing thing, but if you're, I don't see us deploying large scale uh, HPC systems where we have a smart NIC on every node. Uh, briefly, I'm gonna talk a little bit about applications and how they've changed. Um, it used to be when I started at Sandia, everything that we did for resource management for a large scale HPC system was based on the fact that we were gonna be running a single large modeling and simulation application for two weeks at a time, and we needed to reduce the turnaround time for that. Um, that's still the case, but we've also got significantly more complexity in our applications. So we're no longer looking at a single large modeling and simulation code that's run in a batch mode and is gonna consume all the resources on a machine. The applications themselves are more complex. They've got more components to them, so it's not just one simulation part, it's multiple simulations that are working together. Uh, so I like to call this the multi-problem. We've got multi-physics, multi-materials, multi-scale, all working within that application where they need to be um, work together. Um, potentially different programming models and programming systems as well uh, in, involved in all of those. And uh, composability is really the challenge for us. And so being able to compose things that come from different places and put them together in, in a single application is, is what's driving this. And you can see uh, from the diagram that we're not just throwing a modeling and simulation code out there. We're also tying in analytics um, and using different parts of the application um, in workflow components. And so that's really driving the complexity of where our applications are going. So a little bit about software as well. You can't talk about software in, in HPC networking without talking about low-level programming systems and abstraction layers for those. And so I've just got a slide here that shows um, a number of those that have been developed over the years. So since MPI dominates uh, the programming model, it's the programming system for uh, about 98% of the things that we run in high-performance computing. Um, all of the, the time and effort we put in from a research perspective really goes into understanding those low-level programming models that come to us from the network vendors and figuring out how to translate those and, and get them to work well for MPI and some of the other services that I'll mention that we, that we look at. But you can look at the history of HPC over the last 30 years and see an abundance of network programming layers that came out with the different networks and then abstraction layers that actually uh, help uh, be able to use those. So I wrote, I wrote a book chapter for a networking book, High Performance Networking Book in 2009 that detailed a lot of the features in these low-level network programming layers. Of all the ones that I wrote at, about at that time, I think there's, there's three left that people are still using. The first one is obviously sockets. Uh, the second one is InfiniBand verbs, which I think is still getting some use out there. And then the other one is the portals layer, which shows up in various other places as well. So there's been a lot of turnover in the HPC community. So one of the things that I mentioned here is that a lot of what we do from uh, low-level network programming layers and abstraction layers is try to fix this mismatch between what the network actually provides and what the upper layer protocols need. And with MPI, that's a little bit challenging. And so the example that I show here is that for RDMA technology like IB verbs, you get all of these benefits from uh, a, a standpoint of being able to deliver messages directly from one address space into a remote address space without any copies, so even though we call it zero, zero copy, it's a single copy from, from one address space to another address space. No CPU overhead needed, goes directly from the network into memory. You have a fixed amount of resources that you set aside so you know what size message uh, you're gonna transfer and things can just flow. You know when it's finished, you know when it's started, everything is pretty easy. As soon as you put MPI point to point on top of that, however, you lose a significant benefit of what IB and RDMA networks provide. So for the most part, MPI is two-sided. So uh, you have to do things like match incoming messages for messages that you don't expect to be there. You have to set aside resources to manage those. 
The CPU then has to get involved in every message because you're either doing matching or you're managing those buffers. Um, completion may be non-local, and so you're not just waiting for the data to show up, you're waiting for a synchronization event to tell you that the data is actually good and then you can move on. And so, small example of the different things where even though you get some high performance network, low level network programming layer provided to you, you still need to do some uh, uh, software to actually make it deliver what you want it to be able to do. And if you look at high performance computing, that's where a lot of the, the low level network programming layers and abstraction layers come into play. So I talked about MPI, there's a couple other programming systems on partition global address space models that people actually use as well that have different semantics from MPI. We have IO and file systems as well where we're using the high performance networking layer to do that and the low level programming interface. Data management also comes into play. And so typically each one of these has their own abstraction layer that they put on top of the low level networking layer. So why do we have so many low level networking layers? Well, it seems like every time we had a new, a vendor provide us a new network, they came along with a new API to give us, right? So they have, they wanted the ability to deploy new technologies, give us new features, they would give us a new API to go with it. And so the reason we have abstraction layers in our software is to deal with the fact that we're gonna get these different APIs all the time. So there were other reasons that, that vendors did this. My favorite example is, is a particular vendor that had three different networks that they were, uh, they had three different low level programming APIs for, they were selling systems. And they decided that they, didn't, they couldn't afford all the software development that was going into those and so they consolidated it all into one. And so what that meant was every, every uh, software layer that was using those now had, instead of three abstractions that it needed to port to, it had four, right? It didn't change anything for us. It reduced their development costs, but it didn't really change anything from our perspective. So I talked about software trends that are impacting us. Um, just to reiterate that, if you look at GPUs and how to integrate GPUs into HPC and MPI effectively, there's a recent work from uh, Patrick Bridges' group at the University of New Mexico and our collaborators there, where they look at the, the combination of different GPU vendors, whether it's NVIDIA, Intel GPUs, AMD GPUs, and the different network technologies that are out there, whether it's uh, NVIDIA's InfiniBand, uh, Cray's HP's Slingshot, um, the mechanisms to actually integrate GPUs and network interfaces are not there yet. And so there's still a lot of exploration going on. Uh, this work details the fact that you have this M by N explosion of complexity and how to deal with that. The space is still evolving, the mechanisms are still evolving, and the abstractions need to go with it. And so a single abstraction layer that, that tries to figure out today what those are gonna look like is very challenging. So I mentioned uh, Slingshot and the fact that it's using Ethernet. One of the big developments from an HPC perspective over the last year has been the establishment of the Ultra Ethernet Consortium. So for our perspective, um, this is really great because we're trying to build a community around a more commodity network, get more vendors who can deploy technology that will potentially meet our needs. The great thing right now is that we have a significant number of vendors who are interested in this technology and who are contributing to it. The challenge is that they may not be focused on the things that we care about in HPC because uh, the economics of uh, their decisions drive a lot. And so we could potentially get a lot of people interested in providing solutions that we can't use. And so uh, we're hoping that doesn't happen. Uh, but we're also looking at uh, coalescing around things like the LibFabric API and helping us understand that there's, there's potentially one abstraction layer that we can all program to from an HPC perspective and then have the innovation happen underneath so that we can be somewhat insulated from uh, those advancements. So, just a brief slide on future challenges as I see them. Um, I'm a software guy, and so it's easy for me to talk about challenges and say, hey, that's the hardware. We should be looking at the hardware to help us fix those problems. We still have issues with latency and small message rate for HPC applications. I, again, the reason I put up the Intel Paragon slide was getting a network interface back on the memory bus is certainly a way to deal with some of those challenges for latency and message rate. It does create other challenges. Um, but it certainly helps address the latency problem. Parallelism in the network interface, as the number of compute contexts on a node grows with GPUs, CPUs, the parallelism in the network interface needs to go along with that. And so you can think about this in terms of how many Q pairs do I need when I have so many things communicating? What's my ability to create Q pairs? Will I run out of them? How are they processed efficiently on the network interface? Resiliency is a significant problem for us. 
in an MPI model, when a process goes away, the job fails. We haven't been able to take advantage of a lot of the, the virtualization technology that's been developed. So there's still a potential for us to be able to do that. Lots of work going on in congestion control, um, ensuring that we have some isolation because we have a lot of studies that show uh, sharing network links, noisy neighbors and things like that is a fundamental issue. So we're looking to things like Alter Ethernet uh, to help with those kind of issues as well. And then there is you know, things like active messages, which I didn't talk a whole lot about, but this is the idea of tying a, an execution context to a network event. And you'd like to be able to schedule a thread to, to wake up on the arrival of a network event. And there used to be some hardware infrastructure for doing that. Uh, there was an Intel x86 instruction, uh, pair of instructions called monitor and wait that will allow you to do that efficiently. But that's one of the things where user level networking needs to rely on some other mechanism from a hardware level to actually uh, do something more efficient. So I tried to just give you a quick perspective on the challenges that I see uh, impacting us from an HPC perspective. Increasing complexity is really what we see. It's the scale of that complexity that we're having to deal with. It's not so much the number of, of endpoints that are scaling that we're trying to deal with, but it's, it's just that, that complexity that I think is gonna be driving HPC in the future. So appreciate your time, thank you.